What would you like the power to do? At Bank of America, listening to how people answer this question is how we learn how we can lend, invest, give, and volunteer to ensure the Sacramento region remains vibrant and vital. Bank of America is proud to support public television. Brought to you by Kaiser Permanente, advancing our mission to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. We're looking at a world most of us would never want to visit. A place that feels safer from a distance, filled with people we would never want to know. And yet we cannot take our eyes off of them. This is homelessness, up close and personal, in Sacramento, California. I don't know, I don't want to talk about it right now. Yeah. A state with the fifth largest economy in the world. A state and a city with a problem and no clear solutions. You know, I have to look for another spot to move to. California's homeless problem has reached epidemic proportions. An underculture of the forlorn, struggling for health, for dignity. The challenges, the impacts, the possible solutions. Searching for hope, homeless in Sacramento. Ahern Street in Sacramento at North B. In the middle of a great city with beautiful river views and home to the governor and California state capitol. There are places where conditions border on the medieval. No bathrooms, no running water, a minefield of infectious disease and gloom, and just one location among many in Sacramento under the freeway near Broadway. 31-year-old Kenneth Whitlock. Depending on who describes him, he's either a victim, a villain, or a rebel. There is no question that this environment has shaped him. I have no parents. They're, they're gone. My, my dad died. My mom, my mom died, so. And now Kenneth Whitlock has become a symbol, especially to the city of Sacramento. The city attorney has filed an unprecedented lawsuit charging Kenneth and six other homeless people with being a public nuisance and a drain on police resources. The city wants them banned from the Broadway corridor. The legal action has ignited a fierce debate. There's a statute that defines a public nuisance, and individuals are not a public nuisance. It's unprecedented. This is, this is so totally contrary to our constitution, our understanding of uh, rights to travel freely. But in the meantime, Civil rights attorney Mark Barron represents house, Kenneth pro we bono. And we're so far from actually living our principles in this country. It just, it's, it makes me just very angry, frustrated, and I feel that most of the people who are making these decisions are just hypocrites. The reality is that they're really being uh, criminalized for just being poor or homeless. Specifically, the lawsuit charges Kenneth with vandalism and theft. I don't steal from I don't steal from the poor. I steal from the rich. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm being honest. He is also charged with drug-related crimes. Is there new ones? Yeah. Most of the homeless do drugs. They do meth, crystal meth. They do heroin. They do everything because they're sad, they're depressed, they're miserable. Being on the streets, being on the slums in Sacramento. Here on the streets, laws mean little. Unwritten codes become gospel. The homeless live in a morally flipped universe where what's right can be wrong, and what's wrong often becomes right. I hustle. I do whatever it takes to get the next buck. Not do whatever it takes, like sexual, but I hustle as in, I do whatever it takes to, to ease myself, to ease my pain the drug dealers coming to these people who are living in these camps to sell them drugs. Selling drugs while living practically right next door to the genteel world most of us take for granted. Land park, so lush, so green, so close to the freeway. And there's been theft. There's been instances of vandalism, defecation on people's uh, yards. Mitch Rohrer is president of the Neighborhood Association. Here you will find homes worth a million dollars, yet blight is in plain sight. Some here say they've had enough. 
I'm going to fight for public safety. Two neighborhoods so close and yet so far apart. This is my first time ever being homeless. And it hurts me because everybody that come out here, they automatically assume I'm an addict because every homeless person is an addict, but that's not true. Rebecca L. Sue worked as an in-home caregiver until the hours went away and then the income. Now, this is all she can afford. I didn't want to be out here, but I'm out here because of life. And Rebecca, just one of 6,000 people living on our streets. In California, two-thirds of our homeless population is living outdoors. And I think because some of those folks are so visible that we make it easy to forget that there are a lot of people on the streets who are real victims. The majority of these I would have to refer to as vagrants because these are folks who passing through the neighborhood, coming into city center to get food or clothing or whatever they need and then back to their camp wherever it may be. Mitch is describing a cycle and Sacramento Mayor Daryl Steinberg knows all about it. He co-chairs a statewide commission dealing with the estimated 100,000 homeless across California. I think that's unacceptable. And I think most Californians think it's unacceptable. And if it costs $1.5 billion a year to get 75 or 90,000 people off the streets in a shelter and with the right intensive case management, that's better than we have now. What we have now are too many places like this. The K Street Mall turned into a refuge of last resort. <laughs> Dion Dwyer knows it intimately. He works for the Downtown Sacramento Partnership. They do their best to connect people with housing. People often say that we have a housing crisis, but I'd say we have a humanitarian or homeless crisis that's stuck in a system that is in crisis. Our mental health and our drug addiction um, services, they're just not able to meet the needs of an individual on the sidewalk. Jerry, we need to go out. Across Sacramento, from downtown to even in Midtown, homelessness is more than a humanitarian issue. When taxpayers and property enter the equation, it becomes political. Rosanna Garcia lives and works in Midtown. Like many residents and business people across the city, she supports shelters as a solution. But when Mayor Steinberg asked every neighborhood to identify possible locations, many people pushed back. Everybody doesn't want it in their backyard. And you can't just like put them all on a bus and ship them out if you don't get to the root cause. It's just always going to be, and the root cause is mental health. I farm businesses that blow me away. And so the ever elusive questions, how did we get here? How do we solve it? And is there a place for people where low income housing is so hard to find? Where just the number of people living in cars has increased by 60% in two years. This is not the way 68-year-old Lizanne Strait chose to live her golden years. My bad. Though in this world, any roof beats no roof at all. This is how I get in. Try to. And yet, Lisa Ann is hardly unique. She's one in five. That's how many homeless seniors we have. 20%. Lori Mendoza fixed a demographic, too. This is my sanctuary whenever it gets too difficult out there on the streets. I had a house in Fair My grandchildren were fourth generation into that house. But the bank foreclosed on that house in 2010. It reduced Lori's life to this and whatever comfort she could muster. I have cooked in here, but it's, it's dangerous, you know, and you, you really don't want to do that. Lori has four sons. Growing up in the old place, life was good until 19-year-old James developed a serious mental illness. He was in Napa Hospital for nine months, and when he came out, they did a wonderful job. But next, a change in medication. It sent James spiraling. In an absence of treatment, Lori is convinced he's living somewhere out here. He's doing the drugs, too. So now Lori is out here, worried that her son has given up. Every day she searches, praying for the relief and simple pleasure that would come from seeing his face. You know, and I'm all he has. I feel like I'm not going to live very much longer because of this all. Sometimes he lays back here. 
Despondency begets determination, and finally, luck as at last she spots her boy. James? But it's only a respite for a mother with a son having mental health issues while addicted to meth and living on the streets. What can save her child? Yes, I will. So what's going on, James? We have to have um, enough ready services and programs to meet the needs of that population. And until we do, um, we'll continue to experience issues on the street. I think there's also a misnomer that um, the solution to very complicated and diverse issues such as homelessness can have a simple solution. Simple solutions? Elusive when we confront the skyrocketing numbers of homeless people. Every couple of years, every community is expected to do a point in time count. Uh, this is a requirement from the federal government. The latest count shows homelessness has jumped 19% in Sacramento in two years, with close to 6,000 people living on our streets. 93% of the folks that we surveyed said they come from Sacramento. So it's dispelling a myth that somehow Sacramento is attracting people from outside the region. I don't believe the statistics that all of these people are homegrown. Um, I believe when you open up and you say, oh, here I am, I'm open for business for vagrants or homeless people, come and get your needles, come and get your food, that they're, they're going to come. Wherever the homeless come from, they now find themselves in a turf war between the haves and the have-nots. It falls on the police to protect everyone. Police officers are in a job that only police officers can respond to some of the things that police officers respond to. Police officers are expensive. Studies show that between 911 calls and emergency room visits, supportive housing is actually cheaper long-term than chronic homelessness. Sergeant William Wan leads a special homeless impact team. He took us to filthy water tunnels where people live. It is a drainage ditch, yeah. And right now it's kind of somewhat dry, but when the rain starts, it's gonna be, they're all gonna be underwater. Which means that all of this stuff has to go. The living rooms, the game rooms, the crack pipes, the shopping carts, and of course, residents like Paul Flanagan. Right now I live in a tunnel and uh, I'm macro, I'm stocking. I have to look for another spot to move to. It might eventually be here. On this lot in Meadowview, the city plans to build what it calls a low barrier triage shelter. Low barrier means no drug testing and pets are allowed. There is one catch. The new shelter will accommodate women and children only. So guys like Paul, out of luck. In this case, we've got people that are completely blocking the sidewalk. Back at Ahern and North B, morning sheds light on eviction notices. Everyone here knows the drill. People clear the sidewalks while police, they offer one person a slight ray of hope. They have one bed for a woman that'll be available at 11 a.m. So basically it's the same thing that happens every day. We call over there to see if they have any shelter beds available. Today they had one for a woman. Good, good, good. It is a fact of life out here that communities of color represent homeless people disproportionately. If you lose track of the little wins, then it's just gonna be too depressing. But there are so many others. Tanya Richardson grew up in chaos. Like 80% of the homeless, her parents used drugs. It seemed almost inevitable that she would too. My mom was in and out of jail and prison. And I started using heroin when I was 10. Tanya and others like her do get some support. During days, she leaves her dog Ryder in a kettle at Lowe's and Fishes. When night comes, the two of them walk over to City Hall and find a place to sleep. She has every right to be here. In 2018, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that if shelters are not available, homeless people have a right to sleep outside. Those legalities are hardly a comfort for Tanya as she settles in on the hard concrete. It just takes a long time because there's not enough housing. Is my stuff okay? Oh, it's okay. We'll okay, sorry. But nowadays, she can't even take this for granted. Sacramento is appealing the Ninth Circuit decision to the Supreme Court. If lawyers win and sleeping on the street becomes illegal, what happens to people like Tanya? 
I do not want to get to a place where we lose the humanity here because it's still an issue of people who, through no fault of their own, find themselves in the worst of situations, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I. A few blocks from City Hall, Moody Tanksley lives in a cardboard box. From one day to the next, he moves from corner to corner, hustling his next cigarette or cup of coffee. All of this takes a toll. If you lose about 25 years off your lifespan by just being on the streets of Sacramento. Moody is what the system describes as chronically homeless. He's had help. Dion Dwyer and the Downtown Partnership have taken him in several times. But Moody is the type who won't stay. Chronic cases like him make up roughly one third of Sacramento's homeless. Long term, they rarely get off the streets. If we don't address the drug and mental health issues, housing's not gonna make a difference with that population. The other issue with homelessness, public health. When people live on the street, it's bad for them and bad for everyone else. Early mornings, the downtown partnership tries to stay ahead of the filth. They wash sidewalks and alleyways, cleaning, scrubbing, picking up trash. But they cannot clean away the accidents, the murders, and the suicides as Sacramento's homeless death toll soars. A lot of times it's from drug and alcohol overdoses. Sometimes it's just from being homeless. People give up hope. When cities this year are going to get $275 million of new resources to build low barrier triage shelters to bring people off the streets and put them in places like this. The Capitol Park Hotel in downtown Sacramento provides 180 beds and a staff dedicated to helping people navigate their issues. It's not an ultimate destination, more like a transition portal between the streets and permanent housing. Most chronic homeless people with serious mental illnesses and substance abuse disorders cannot go from the riverbanks and the streets into permanent housing without a bridge without that intensive triage shelter with the services and the assessment to make sure that they are ready to move on to a longer term housing situation. That's because the streets are rough. No one knows better than Dave Elliott from the nonprofit Sacramento Steps Forward. At Ahern, he chances upon a 24 year old former foster child. Her name is Amatsa Yashrahia. Those cuts on both of her arms testify to years of incomprehensible suffering. I used to self-harm as a child. Foster youth run a high risk for homelessness. Same for LGBTQ people, veterans, and those living with mental and physical illness. The sadness is as widespread as the frustration. I don't know that they're doing something that's effective. Because again, the results are in. We just seem to have more and more of these people in, in our city and state. As a homeowner, Mick says he's fed up. And here's another reason why. On this vacant lot, not far from his home in Land Park, the city is putting up a 100 bed, low barrier triage shelter. It seems that our mayor and the city council, not all of them, want to open up small little boutique <laughs> shelters, if you will, very expensive. In, in many cases, and apparently the results haven't been that good either. But studies show that for shelters to be most effective, they need to go up where the homeless already live. This keeps them connected to services, especially medical. For most homeless people, their access to care is through the emergency room. And hospitals want to change that. Kaiser, Sutter, UC Davis, Dignity Health, they've all begun collaborating towards solutions. All four health systems have come together and provided the funding for a program, Intermediate Care Program, or ICP. If someone is discharged from the hospital, we have beds and housing that we can, that are provided through ICP where the individual can receive ongoing care. In 2014, Dignity Health launched a separate pilot project. In partnership with Lutheran Social Services, we created the program Housing with Dignity. Corey Baker, a single mom with three kids, is an example of Dignity's success. Her trip into homelessness began with a car that broke down that kept her from working. That led to the family becoming destitute. 
when the weather was like 20 some degrees, my son and I and our dog were living outside and that, and it was really unbelievable. And then when it seemed that Corey's life could not get much worse, severe pain sent her to the emergency room. I had stage four cancer with 20% chance to live. In the hospital, Corey's life hit rock bottom. That's when Dignity stepped in and began turning her life around. While the hospital provided treatment, Lutheran Social Services gave Corey an apartment. I didn't even pay rent. And they said, we just want you to worry about getting better. That's it. Today, Corey is cancer free. She and her kids have a new home. And now that Corey has a car, she's working again. We found evidence. That is one success story, but still, unfortunately, it is an exception. In Sacramento, homelessness continues to strong arm so many others, including hundreds of people living along the American River Parkway. It's very difficult. Being homeless is not a crime. From the Sacramento Police Department's helicopter, Sergeant Randy Van Dusen oversees some of those encampments. And this is actually looking pretty nice right now as far as cleanliness. From the air, tents are fairly easy to spot. On the ground, they're impossible to miss. Bryant Ortega. When a teenager goes to prison, he often ends up in a place like this. Former inmates are 10 times more likely to become homeless. In many cases, they lack job skills or family support. This is how I live right now. Uh. If you look around, it becomes obvious that without the luxury of basic medical care, homeless people often get serious diseases that go untreated. That happened to Brian. I got liver cancer. The river is another area that outreach worker Dave Elliott visits frequently. When he sees Bryant, they connect immediately. What I want for myself is to get better. The American River Parkway used to be a popular attraction for families. But the growing presence of homeless people has begun to keep them away. They're just tucked in the trees, tents. Testing of river water shows high levels of E. coli, a sign of fecal contamination. As the homeless population grows, so does the health hazard. You know, our impact team does a good job at least knowing our homeless subjects that are out there and checking in with them a lot. And sometimes they get people out. Kimberly Doss now lives in a county transitional shelter. It is a start, but even here she has so much to work through. The pain and, I don't know, okay. Hold on. This large home is what social workers call a low-barrier, scattered-site housing model. The county rents houses and helps people transition back into normal life. I want to show by example that there is a second chance. There is hope. Over here is 2040 Railroad. This is where we had the shelter. He's talking in past tense about Railroad Drive, as they called it, which sits directly across from the river. For 17 months, this converted warehouse served hundreds of people. Then it ran out of funding and closed, but not before providing yet another possible shelter model. Our low barrier triage approach, like what we did on Railroad Avenue, we got hundreds of people into longer term housing. The shelter gave outreach workers like Patrick Cornell from Sacramento Covered a place to take people. Among them, Anthony Moss and Ramona Jasper. They'd been hunkered in down at the river for years. We came from right down there. I, I mean, I had a, a big, large tent, a generator chained up, a refrigerator. I mean, it was home. Because of their relative comforts, the couple resisted Patrick's offers to help. Ramona doesn't like crowded spaces, she said, but Patrick kept after them. And they kept seeing others getting housed to where they said, hey, um, that thing that you offered us before, the shared housing, we want to do that. And I said, good, because we got a good spot coming up. And their whole entire life has changed. One year and three months later, Ramona finally found it within herself to return to the river. Then the same place that once gave her comfort haunted her. <laughs> In a city teeming with so much homeless hopelessness, Ramona and Anthony represent a success story. What might be if. It has been a journey from the river to a shelter to a place they now call home.
So we came from railroad drive to this house. This right here is a positive outcome of two individuals that at first were like going, wait a minute. Now when the couple cooks breakfast, it's on a real stove and eaten at their own dining room table. This is my home. <laughs> you know, I got a place to call home and I love it. Ramona and Anthony have running water, a mailbox, they pay bills, and most importantly, they feel safe. The difference in zipping up at the end of the night to secure yourself or turning the key with a deadbolt. Homeless advocates say Ramona and Anthony are survivors, proof that the system can work. We are survivors. We are people that believed into this system. We didn't at first, but we do now. The challenge now is to take what we have seen works and to bring it to scale. But how? I know that there's something greater than all that we're doing right now, and that's my hope. That remains the complex question for so many still out there among the nearly 6,000. Struggling to survive. Fighting off despair. Searching for hope. What would you like the power to do? At Bank of America, listening to how people answer this question is how we learn how we can lend, invest, give, and volunteer to ensure the Sacramento region remains vibrant and vital. Bank of America is proud to support public television. Brought to you by Kaiser Permanente, advancing our mission to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. 